Good morning, church family, and happy Sabbath. I am so excited for our guest speaker here today. Uh, we are very privileged to have Dr. Davidson from Andrews University Theological Seminary sharing with us. He is a professor of Old Testament and has taught on today's theme, the sanctuary, for 35 years. And great, grateful that he's got safe travels and he has such a passion for Jesus and his church. And we get to have him here with us this morning. I know he, he told me, he said, I don't... I don't like doctor, you know, I don't, I don't need titles, but it's really hard to call one of your teachers by their first name. So I'm just going to defer to Professor Davidson now and invite him to come up and share with us. We're glad you're here. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Or as our Hebrew brothers and sisters would say, Shabbat Shalom. It is so good for me to be out here under the shadow of mighty mountains to, uh, I was driving from the airport and looking up at Mount Rainier, and uh, my son just finished climbing that not long ago, and uh, I, w I still want to get it under my belt before I'm done climbing mountains, but I live in the flatlands of Michigan, <laughs> where I'm a thousand miles from the nearest mountain, and I grew up out here in the west among the mountains, and so I actually flew into Portland uh, and you know, one wing almost touches Mount Hood as you fly in there to PDX and then to drive up through these other mighty sentinels of the Ring of Fire uh, brings me great joy and great rejuvenation. Back in Michigan, the only higher, the highest place I can get for elevation is to climb apple trees, you know? So to come here where the mighty mountains exist is, is a great joy for me. And I'm thankful for your pastoral team. I'm thankful for Pastor Seth. Uh, he was a st student at, of, of ours back at the seminary in, the, what, 2005, 2007. And it's always wonderful to see your students uh, go out and hopefully maybe stand on your shoulders and then go way beyond you in his ministry. And I'm just thankful. Uh, I don't know whether I'm supposed to say this, but I, I want to congratulate him publicly for just passing his comprehensive exams. And, and I think a couple of days ago he defended, his or, defended admirably his project for his oral defense. And I still have nervous twitches from when I took my comprehensives, and that's been longer ago than I like to admit, so I'm very proud that he's succeeded and that he's, he's on to his dissertation and so forth. So, Well, I have a question to start our, our series out with, and this is a, a simple question. If, if you just had one thing that you would ask God for, just one thing that you would say, Lord, please, what would you add? Can I hear from anyone? What comes to your mind? First thing, yes. On this earth or there? Whatever it is. Uh, I'd like, I ask him to give me the faith like he gave Solomon wisdom. All right, give me faith like he gave Solomon wisdom. Wonderful. What else do some of the rest of you ask for? Holy Spirit to help. Holy Spirit to help. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? The gift of forgiveness. Wow, those are beautiful, beautiful requests. We'll take one more. The salvation of one of my loved ones. Amen. Yes, isn't that on all of our hearts? Yeah, and I think I could go around to everyone here in this church congregation and you would have a little slightly different comment to give and none of those would be wrong. They would all be spot on. But you know, the Bible actually has an inspired answer to that question. There's one biblical writer that posed that question and then gave his answer. And it's tucked away over here in the book of Psalms. Psalm 27. David was fleeing from King Saul. King Saul had accused him of sedition against the government, of trying to steal the throne away from him. And so he was hiding out in the desert of, of Judea, the wilderness of Judea, just maybe one mountain range away from Saul's army every night. And yet he learned to trust God in the midst of that. And he prays here in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then down in verse 4, he poses this very interesting question. Actually states it as a, as a, as, not as a question form, but as a, 
an indicator of his desire. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek. One thing, Lord. And then he gives an answer that we don't often think about. Kind of a strange answer, but when we, got to th when we get to think about it in the next few minutes, I think we may like what he answered. He said, all right, Lord, this is the one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. His focus was upon the house of the Lord, which in his day was the sanctuary, probably up on top of the highest hill around Jerusalem there, the, uh, the place where, near where uh, Samuel was, was buried, according to tradition, and where Solomon went and asked for wisdom on that high place, that high, high hill of just above Gibeon. And David says, Lord, I just want to be at the sanctuary. And, you know, we might be tempted to say, well, that was because he was lonely. He had been out in the wilderness for months, and he hadn't been able to go to church, and he was just sort of, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, wishing he could be back at the, at the sanctuary. But no, it's not just that. Because you fast forward in David's life, and you get to the time when he becomes king in Hebron, and then a few years later, he becomes king crowned again in Jerusalem, and he fights against the Philistines and gets peace for the kingdom, but what's he still thinking about? You come to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and you find that David still has the sanctuary on his mind. And he goes to Nathan and he says, Nathan, I'm living in a beautiful palace and God's still living in a tent. We need to build him a house. Amen. And David hears Nathan say, go ahead. You have my blessing. But as you remember, that night, Nathan gets a dream and has to tell David, David, your hands are filled with blood. You're a warrior. And my house is to be a house of peace for all people. And so your son Solomon, whose name Shlomo means peace, he'll build the house. And David was disappointed. But did he forget about his single-minded quest in life? No. No. He said, Lord, if I can't build it, I can gather the materials. So he starts gathering all these materials, and he spends the rest of his life preparing the materials. And when we get to the end of his life in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, we read this amazing uh, description of David's passion in his life. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1 Furthermore, King David said to all the congregation, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. And then in verse 2, Now for the house of my God I have prepared with all my might. And then in verse 4 he says, Moreover, because I have set my affection upon God the house of the Lord. David loved the sanctuary. And we could look at the various other biblical writers, Old and New Testament, who had their focus on the sanctuary. There's more written about the sanctuary than any other topic in the Bible. I mean, I love the Sabbath, but there's only less than 200 verses about the Sabbath. There's hundreds of chapters about the sanctuary. And so the sanctuary doctrine has been my passion uh, throughout the years of my teaching at Andrews. And the more you study it, the more you realize you're just scratching the surface of this beautiful, beautiful topic. Well, David was not the only one, and the New Testament and Old Testament writers are not the only ones with their focus upon the sanctuary. Our Adventist pioneers were focused on the sanctuary. The Millerite movement was centered in that text in Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy 423 that the subject of the sanctuary was like a window into the whole system of divine truth in Scripture. 
And later in the book Evangelism, uh, she writes that the sanctuary and Jesus' ministry in the sanctuary is the very foundation of our faith. It's a beautiful topic. But you know, I think sometimes we have too narrow a focus on the sanctuary. Too narrow a focus. When I started teaching the doctrine of the sanctuary, I did what everyone else before me that I read had done. They start with Exodus 25 and they look at God's building of Moses' sanctuary and then Solomon's temple and they look at every detail of the sanctuary and see what its symbolism is for the plan of salvation. The sanctuary is like a sandbox. Illustration for the plan of salvation. And it is that. Praise God for that. But this morning, in the minutes, few minutes that we have, I wanted to open our minds to the bigger picture of the beauty of the sanctuary. Now, we could actually spend our whole time just talking about how beautiful the sanctuary was, even regardless of what it has to say about the plan of salvation. You know that tent that they carried around for 40 years in the wilderness? I mean, I go backpacking a lot. I love to climb mountains. I come west to climb whenever I can. But I don't carry four tons of gold in my backpack like the children of Israel did throughout the wilderness because the sanctuary had four tons of gold and a whole ton of silver. It was heavy. And then once they started building a a permanent building in the time of Solomon. Do you know how much gold was in Solomon's temple? Just to give you an idea of how beautiful it was, there was 100,000 talents of gold. You shift that to our weight today, 3,500 tons of gold in Solomon's temple. Wouldn't you like a little of that to help build up, pay off your building project here, you know? <laughs> Couldn't Solomon just have loaned a few more, a few talents? You're, by the way, your, your, your whole plant is awesome. And by God's grace, he's going to lead you to become debt-free and have a wonderful, wonderful experience here for many years to come, until he comes, hopefully. Uh, how about the silver? In Solomon's temple, there was a million talents of silver. That is 35,000 tons of silver. How about the bronze? They tried to count it. It was so much they couldn't even weigh it. The bronze and then the stones, these giant ashlar stones. One stone would come in the time of Solomon from here to that wall, just one stone higher than you could reach, wider than you could reach, and so smooth that you could put a knife blade in between each stone. It was so perfect. And not only the materials, but the beauty of the sanctuary in terms of its singing. Now, I love the praise team today. They took us into heavenly places. Well, David's praise team, Solomon's praise team, was 288 singers with 4,000 instrumentalists and 120 trumpet players, all paid by the tithe, just to praise God. Amen, Amen right? Yes. And not only for hearing did they have beautiful singers, but David was called the sweet singer of Israel, and he spent much of his time writing psalms. He wrote a hundred of the 150 psalms written by David. This is his hymnal. So David prepared the hymnal. And he in, invented, I think he might have invented the first guitar. The way it describes his instrument that he invented, it may have been, he may have been the first guitarist, King David. Who knows? So the sanctuaries on earth were beautiful. But I want us to shift from these beautiful earthly sanctuaries, which were built according to a pattern that God gave to Moses and then to David, and the word there for pattern in the Hebrew actually means a copy of an original. So God 
had that the earthly temple, the earthly sanctuary, were built according to blueprints of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, I got a grand tour in through the secret passages into this place, the phase, what is it, three that's coming? And uh, I even looked in the back room where the uh, uh, kitchen is ready to be launched, I guess, soon here and saw a whole bunch of blueprints laid out there. Yeah, probably blueprints for how that's going to be done. Well, God gave Mo Moses and then Solomon, uh, David, more than blueprints. He actually, well, maybe he gave Solomon the blueprints, but Moses actually saw a miniature model, a scale model of the heavenly original and was told to, to build it like, like what he saw on the mountain. I don't know what the heavenly original looks like. I know it's real. I believe it's real. It's where God comes into time and space to be with his people because he loves us so much. And my professor, Hazel, who was my teacher at Doctrine of the Sanctuary years ago, used to say, I know what the heavenly sanctuary is made out of. You want to know? He'd dangle his carrot in front of us for a few minutes until we would salivate, wanting to know his answer, and he'd say, okay, the heavenly sanctuary is made out of heavenly stuff. Okay, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. But I want us to stretch our mind in the last two mi ten minutes that we have here together of this service. What was the purpose, the original purpose of the heavenly sanctuary? We usually think about it in terms of solving the sin problem. But let's stretch our minds. Let's go back, 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 be actually before the creation of this earth even. Back before sin, was there a heavenly sanctuary even then before sin? If there was, then it has a bigger purpose than solving the sin problem because there was no sin problem then. And we have a couple of texts that we usually use to describe the fall of Lucifer, but they also teach us about the heavenly sanctuary before sin entered. They give us a little sneak peek into what the sanctuary was all about before sin and what it will be again after the sin problem is over. Let's go to those two texts quickly. One is Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. And this whole chapter is a chapter about the fall of Lucifer he was it says here in verse 12 take up a lamentation and say you were the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty you were in Eden the garden of God every precious stone was your covering and then in verse 14 you were the anointed cherub who covers you I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. This is describing Lucifer before he sinned. Before there was any sin in the universe, he was called the anointing cherub who covers. Now, if we are looking at an anointing covered, an anointed covering cherub, where is that cherub doing his work? Sanctuary. In the sanctuary, more precisely. In the most holy place, that's right. So we're getting a vision into the most holy place of the sanctuary where Lucifer is functioning as a covering cherub, just like those golden cherub, cherubim that were covering the ark in the, in the er earthly sanctuaries. And he says it was on the holy mountain of God. So what was the sanctuary for if it wasn't to solve the sin problem? Go to Isaiah 14, where we also find this term, the holy mountain of God. And we also find a description of Lucifer's fall. And his name is actually mentioned here in verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
How are you cut to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the throne, above the stars of God. And I will also sit on the mountain. But notice, notice it doesn't say the mountain of the Lord. It says the mountain of the congregation. Ah. So the heavenly sanctuary, that holy mountain, before it was the place to solve the sin problem, was a place where the unfallen universe congregated and became that congregation to come and worship God. So before the plan of salvation ever went into effect, now I believe it was in the mind of God for eternity. God knew about that sin would come, but before it was put into effect, the heavenly sanctuary was a place where God invited his creatures to come to praise him, to come to be close to him, to come to have intimate fellowship with him. So the sanctuary has a big purpose. I like to call it the Emmanuel purpose. You know, Jesus became Emmanuel, God with us, when he took on human flesh. But I'd like to suggest that Jesus became Emmanuel long before that. Because Emmanuel means God with us. And as soon as God created, according to the biblical text, oh, we need to read that text. Don't take it on my word. Let's read one more text. Jeremiah 17 and verse 12. Most people don't Stop to read this one, but it's one of the most significant ones because it answers the question, how far back can we go in the eternity and still find sanctuary? Jeremiah 17, 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. From the very beginning of creation, as soon as there were creatures, God, who can be above space and time, he's not bound by space and time, but he prepares a place in space and time where his spatio-temporal creatures can come to meet with him, can come to be close with him. And he calls it my house. David said, I long to be in the house of the Lord. You know, Adventists, too often when we think of the heavenly sanctuary, we think of it only in terms of the judgment, investigative judgment. And I'm going to talk about that, the second service. I believe in an investigative judgment, but I believe the sanctuary teaches something even more fundamental than the investigative judgment. Did you know that the, according to the Protestant system of theology regarding the doctrine of God and the Catholic system of theology regarding the doctrine of God and this was passed on all the way down from a, a couple of centuries after the apostles where Greek dualism came in to the thinking of Christians and according to Greek dualism there's only space-time down here we live in space-time but God is beyond space-time he's timeless He's not in any space. He's not in any time. He doesn't have any form. He's beyond, beyond everything. He never comes down to meet with his creatures in space and time. And one of the great contributions of our pioneers was they just, their Adventist pioneers, they just read the Bible as it speaks. And they, they came to the belief that there was a real place in heaven where God comes. He's not aloof he's not impassable he doesn't stay away from his people he's Emmanuel he's God with us from the very beginning and he makes himself a house a home have you ever thought of the sanctuary as God's home as a warm friendly home where he wants to invite us to be close to him but that's the way it's described. The word for temple in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word hekal, which simply means great house. 
And the house of the Lord is the common designation for God's dwelling place. I have to say that I am indebted to one of my students over in Russia for giving me a bigger picture of this heavenly sanctuary. In my younger days, you can know the exact year because it was the year that communism fell in Russia, the summer of 1991. And I was sent by the seminary. I was the youngest teacher at the seminary at that time. And I think the dean thought that, well, if we send Davidson over there and something happens to him and the communists bump him off, we won't lose much. So let's send him over just to see what he can do. So here I was sent to teach all of these seminary professors that were going to start teaching at Zalkski Seminary, but they had no training because they weren't allowed to study theology under communism. So some were doctors, some were nurses, some were philosophers, some were historians, some were musicians. And one of the ladies was an interior decorator, professional interior decorator. And she came up to me several days after our classes started, and I announced how they had to write a paper or something about the, about the sanctuary. And through an, in a translator, she told me, I want to write a, a paper on an interior decorator looks at the heavenly sanctuary. And I thought, whoa, this will be interesting. But I didn't realize how it would change my mind, how it would open my view of what the heavenly sanctuary is. And so when our class was over, again, that same translator translated her paper to me from Russian into English, and then I had to give the grade. But when it was time to give the grade, I could hardly see my paper because I was weeping with joy so much. Because she said, you know, an interior decorator professional interior decorator can go into someone's home and look at the way they decorate and within a few minutes they can tell you what kind of person lives there. They can tell you the character of the person that lives in that home. And so she said, this semester I have been by faith taking a tour of the heavenly sanctuary as an interior decorator. I look at that table of showbread or whatever its equivalent is in heaven and I see there God's dining room. I mean, isn't when it's a table with bread and grape juice on it, isn't that his that dining room? She said, maybe it's that table that's thousands of miles long that Ellen White describes, or miles long, she says, that we will sit at in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus will serve us. Maybe that's the original table of showbread. And then chandeliers that are on the ceiling coming down. You're in the palace of royalty. And I thought about the queen with her chandelier uh, in Great Britain. If you tour the... And my wife is great into the British royalty because her mom is a British citizen. And so she began to describe how this is his living room where we sit under that grand chandelier representing the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit teaches us and will continue to teach us for eternity and for eternity past. And she went on to each part of the sanctuary describing it as God's home. And of course, the most holy place is his office. <laughs> it's, the, it's the control center of the universe. It's where he does his business. Sort of like the White House has a, a wing of the White House where business is done, but then there's the residence as well. So when she was done, I was hooked. I had a different view of the heavenly sanctuary. It's a friendly place where God is wanting us to come. And some people say, well, okay, but when the great plan of salvation is over, there will be no more heavenly sanctuary. Isn't that what Paul and the other... Writers, especially John in Revelation 21, verse 22, John says, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Does John say there's not going to be any more sanctuary there? You've got to read it carefully. He says, I saw no temple in it. In what? In the holy city, right? He's just seeing, he's dicking a tour of the holy city, and he says, I didn't see any temple in it. 
Because ultimately, and we all know, where God is, is a temple. I mean, God himself, his very presence, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb have always been the ultimate temple throughout history. So when there's no building, God's, the temple still is there. But as you read this closely, John doesn't say there won't be a, a place. It won't revert back to its original doxological function. Because the next verse he says, and there'll be no more, the city had no more need of the sun or the moon to shine because the glory of God uh, is, and the Lamb is its light. But we know from Isaiah that the sun will be seven times brighter and the moon will be seven times brighter. But in the city, God's glory will be so dominant that we will hardly even notice the sun and the moon because of the effulgence of his glory. So what's going on here? Will there be a temple or will there not? Let me point you to one more text in this same chapter, Revelation 21. And as John sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of God after the millennium, often in Revelation, John sees something and then God tells him, here's what you see. So here comes the temple down. Now I, John, verse 2, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a voice, a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And it uses the very word that was used for the sanctuary in the wilderness, the skene, the tabernacle. But now it's not just a little building in the desert, nor is it a giant, beautiful building like Solomonic Temple, or is it even the grand palace of the plan of redemption. It has now been expanded, according to this, to be the whole city. In fact, as you look a few verses later in verse 16, he measures the city and it says its length, its breadth, its height, are equal. Well, if you have something equally long and wide and high, what shape is that? It's a cube. And the only thing connected with anything sacred in the Bible that's a cube shaped is the most holy place. So what God is telling us is he's going to expand the most holy place of the, sanct of the heavenly temple and bring it down to this earth so this earth will be the center of the universe and he will invite us to be there with him in that holy of holies. In fact, we'll have a home there. My last text to read to you is one that may you have never seen it like this before. But if you think of the house of the Lord as God's home, then look at John 14, 1 to 3. In my Father's house. Don't go there yet. In my Father's house. What's that? My Father's house. The house of the Lord. The temple. And in the new earth, it's going to be the whole new Jerusalem. In my Father's house are many rooms. Many mansions are rooms. You know, when the priests in Solomon's day, when they... Uh, went out up from their country home they went and they stayed in their city home and there was a house around for each of the priests around the sanctuary around the temple God says I'm preparing Jesus says I'm preparing many rooms in that temple and when I get done I'm going to come and get you and you all will have a city home in the new Jerusalem the house, the tabernacle, the sanctuary of God. Now I know most of you, and I'll be joining you, we'll have our country home out here in the west under the shadow of Mount Rainier or one of these other mountains. But every Friday afternoon we'll be able to head to Jerusalem by the speed of thought and we'll be able to get into our city home in the new Jerusalem. Isn't it a beautiful picture of God? And so when this lady was finished with her paper, she said, I know who God is because I've looked at his house. And as an interior decorator, I can tell you, he's an awesome, beautiful God. May we take with us this day this picture of the sanctuary as the place of praise for eternity and will be our home forever. Amen.